Um, hi, everybody. I am Dave Marshall. I'm the founder and CEO of Mongoose, and we are honored to partner with Inside Higher Ed to bring you today's presentation. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be uh, a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation today. So please submit your questions via the Q&A widget. Um, and remember that you can upvote other people's questions as well. The student journey, as everybody that, that is uh, on this webcast uh, surely knows, um, has traditionally you know, started with outreach to juniors and seniors, and um, but now in this ultra competitive environment, a lot of times that, that, outreach, that outreach starts sooner. And um, the student journey uh, has become more complex. So because of that, um, institutions need more personalized communications with their constituents. Um, so not only students, but parents and alumni, um, and sometimes community. And um, so we are uh, the, the the institutions have a need to communicate more personally and do so at scale. Um, so we often encourage our clients to uh, keep with the motto, build better relationships. So build better relationships than any of your competitors, uh, build better relationships so that students don't get lost in the process, build better relationships so you could fulfill your institution's mission, um, build better re relationships so that you can level the playing field for all students, uh, that, that they can find their way uh, through the student journey. The student journey uh, is not linear, and that is not a surprise to anyone. Um, everyone that's here today, probably to some capacity, uh, their job description includes form better relationships with students or constituents or parents. And so when we so when we think about like what a good relationship is, good relationships have qualities of a sense of belonging. Good relationships have qualities of trust, where safe communication, where it's safe to communicate about things that might be on your mind. And good communication means when both people believe the other person truly cares, that they want to be part of that conversation. Um, so Mongoose works with 750 uh, higher ed institutions to help them communicate with their students. And I mention that be because we have a very unique opportunity to watch constituent communication across 750 schools and I can tell you that there's no path that's the same. Uh, they all have different types of conversations with different students and different staff members. Um, and we've seen firsthand how technology can help institutions create a more authentic and empathetic experience with their entire audience. We've invited panelists today who have seen success in using technology to build lasting relationships at their inst institutions and they're gonna share their insights with us. With that, I'm excited to bring on Mike Kaczynski, uh, the, our Client Engagement Manager at Mongoose to introduce our panelists today and moderate the discussion. Mike. Yes, thank you, Dave. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining wherever you are from. We have four fantastic panelists joining us. Um, as Dave alluded to, I am Mongoose's Client Engagement Manager, meaning I get to talk to clients like our uh, three of our four individuals and learn about all their best practices, their strategies and tactics, and spread those internally and externally. So very happy to be your moderator, uh, even more happy to introduce our uh, four panelists. So our first panelist is a rising star in undergraduate recruiting. Tony Sarda is the Director of Undergraduate Admissions at St. Mary's University in Texas. From Baltimore and one of Morning Consult's top 10 most trusted universities, Emily Calderon is the Executive Director for Student Transitions and Family Engagement at Johns Hopkins University. A 30-year veteran and expert on annual giving, Eric Weber is the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Annual Giving at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. 
And Amy Kilpatrick is Mongoose's Associate Vice President of Product. She articulates higher education's needs and translates them into actionable product updates. So um, Dave will manage the Q&A as we alluded to earlier. Um, selfishly, I have become somewhat obsessed with this idea of lifelong learning and a lifelong student journey. So uh, please help us out. I would love to explore this topic in greater depth. So uh, please, as you feel comfortable, put those questions into the Q&A and we will select them via upvotes. But um, first, let's get into the questions. So we'll start uh, in order. Uh, we'll go Tony, Emily, and Eric will follow the student journey. Um, Amy, you can tell us about the technological implications of their answers. But um, starting right off, with all the different areas uh, represented, the different aspects of the student journey, um, I guess starting with Eric, could you please share how you use technology on your campus to build relationships and what impact that technology has made on your audiences? Sure, Mike. Um, you know, it's it's interesting to me, and, and I don't mean to sound cliche, but technology is certainly accelerating um, in, in our lives. And um, first and foremost, because we're so used to using technology in our everyday life, it's incumbent upon us that we uh, develop a strategy in a lot of these new spaces um, to um, make sure that we're meeting people where they are. So we are involved in, in social media, um, we're, we're producing videos, um, we're using texting, email. Um, we we do some um, analysis of our engagement and our donors. Um, some scoring methods that we use to um, try to figure out who we need to engage more, um, who may be um, the right person to to make an ask, and um, so so it's it's really become. Um, kind of part of our everyday life in in our institution as well as our our lives. Very good. And my apologies, I um, sometimes happens in higher education. Skipped over enrollment management, so my apologies. Um, Tony, what do you think? No, it's all right. Enrollment managers need to learn to be flexible, if nothing else. So that's totally okay, Mike. And thank you to Mike and and Jessica and Dave and everybody that has um, asked us to be here and to all of our guests. Um, I work with a totally different constituency than Eric, right? Like the, I, I work at a traditionally residential liberal arts college. The majority of the students that I'm working with are 17 to 18 years old. Um, and, and the technology is a tool, right? But it's not the how of the, of the way that you build the relationship. Um, I love working with teenagers because they remind me how much I don't know about technology. Um, you know, not only are they not obtuse to the way that technology works, but they can run circles around me, right? And they can run circle, circles around everybody in, in my office. And because, you know, Eric made a lot of really great points, like we have texting, we have social media, um, you know, we, we try to be present on YouTube, but that doesn't necessarily mean that students as a default want us in those spaces. Um, it's a people business at the end of the day, and we have to see them as students that are, you know, their own people with their own motivations and their own aspirations and fears. That's what should be dictating the relationship building, right? At the end of the day, how we acknowledge them as people and what their motivations are the technology is the means to then understand how they want us to work with them, but we can't do that if we don't know who they are. And I think the more that we can do that rapport building on the front end, the technology ends up meeting their needs and our needs. Um, but having enough information from the people to understand the relationship and where the tech becomes a part of the relationship, I think becomes a really powerful piece of the understanding. Emily, what do you think? Yeah, I have to agree with my colleagues. I think um, the theme for us here is really using technology to understand students by name and story so that they feel seen and heard at an institution, you know, whether it be small or large. Um, we know that the research tells us that um, uh, knowing students by name and story, um, students feel like they're being seen and like they matter. And that really matters for their ability to um, be retained by an institution and pursue their degree within a four to six year timeline. Um, and so those types of things help and the texting platforms, the technology platforms are one way to start that conversation with the students um, so that you get a chance to customize those messages for the student so that they feel like their individual voice, their individual story matters um, at the institution rather than being part of a larger number scheme. Very good. 
So Tony, you mentioned relationship building. Emily, you mentioned learning names and stories. So uh, starting with Tony, how much time do you spend using technology to drive your audiences, in your case, uh, primarily prospective students, to get things done versus actually authentically building relationships with them? Yeah, it's, it's a delicate balance for us because, you know, as I mentioned um, previously, you can't get things done without the relationship building that comes in first. Um, what I've seen in, you know, now my 14th year of working in enrollment management is that a lot of shops can get really transactional with the communications that they have with prospective students. And, you know, putting yourself in their position, it can be really tough being told what you have not done constantly. You have not visited campus. You haven't submitted an application. You haven't done your deposit. You know, it ends up being all of these things that students can perceive as deficiencies, but we can't get them to understand the why they should want to do those things. For, you know, forget the how, right? Why should I want to fill out an application? Why should I want to visit? That comes with the relationship building and understanding how millennials, Gen Zs, and down to an individual student, you know, how do they want to be communicated with and what are the things that resonate with them? And again, it comes back to that relationship part. You know, for me as a, as a manager and as a leader in my office, I understand that time is the commodity that I cannot buy more of, right? And it's tough to go to your team and say, it's time consuming to go into all of these relationships, not knowing what the outcome is going to be, but you're not going to get the outcome without the relationship building and the time that goes in with it. So I think to answer your question, Mike, it kind of fluctuates depending on the time of the year and who you're working with. Um, but, but I've seen in my experience that you're just not going to get the results that you want, whether it's enrollment satisfaction from your team if you're not putting that time in to build the relationships to using the technology. Emily, have you seen that with current students? We definitely have. I think it's also um, really easy for people to default to um, sending constant reminders about, you know, the the to do the student to do list that we we have for students on a regular basis. Um, and I think where I have tried to push back um, here with some success is really linking those messages to our institutional priorities. Right. It's um, more important to make sure that the if we are telling students, right, these are the things you haven't done, that they're linked to some kind of institutional priority. Um, and, and again, like Tony mentioned, are not coming from a deficiency model, um, but really a student success model, right? So instead of you haven't done your forms, you know, did you know that by completing your financial aid forms, you could be eligible for more money next year or something along those lines? So I think the way that those messages are framed um, and how they link back to your, your own individual goals um, for your students as as well as the institutional goals really matters. Eric, what does that look like for alumni and donors? Yeah, so so I can actually talk a little bit about students as well. Um, but you know, Tony uh, made the comment of the day. I mean, time is scarce um, for all of us, and um, so so if we can leverage our time um, to to work better toward outcomes, we're all going to be better off. And and excuse me, so one of the things, uh, we employ a fair amount of students in our engagement center, and we used to handle all of our follow-up after those applications were received via email. And uh, we, we there would be a great amount of attrition. Um, we wouldn't hear back from students. And we shifted all of those communications, those follow-up communications to text messaging. And I think we've we may have lost one or two students in the process who didn't respond. So it actually saves us time because we don't have to send more emails. Um, and then in terms of of the the realm of alumni, um, so so first and foremost, uh, we send event reminders all the time for a couple of reasons. I think people expect that kind of concierge service, if I may use that term. Um, but it's also an easy way for them to instantly communicate and say, hey, you know what, I apologize, but I can't make the event, or which plaza did you say this event was occurring in, because I'm not sure where that is, or the most important question on any college campus is, now where do I park again? Um, so it's an instant uh, way to, to communicate and receive feedback. And in our case, it's actually saved us a little bit of time. Very good. So Amy, we've heard things like leveraging time. That sounds very technology driven. What do you think? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I was going to build off of what Tony had had shared uh, in the beginning of this question as well as, you know, helping students get something done and building a relationship. A lot of times it's one in the same and relationships are built on trust. And one of the biggest ways that we can build trusting relationships is giving people what they need when they need it on their terms, um, being accessible to them. And I think through those kind of everyday interactions, um, you get the opportunity to connect on a deeper level. You know, we we get the uh, pleasure of reading some of the messages that that happen between our clients and, and their students and audiences. Thank you so much. I, I thought I missed this deadline. I wasn't going to be able to come this year or I wasn't sure that I could balance school and family, but you've been so supportive. Now I know I can do it. So um, so it's one and the same, um, and and hopefully that's a relief <laughs> uh, to to uh, our folks here that you know you can you can help them get things done and build relationships at the same time. Very good. So uh, Amy, you said something very interesting: being accessible to your audience on their terms. So Tony, how has using technology prioritized relationships and, and helped you have a more uh, empathetic communication style with your audiences? Yeah, I'll actually use an example of something that we just recently did with um, Cadence, which is our text messaging platform. You know, we spent a lot of time, I think, in the last you know, 15 minutes or so talking about the relationship between the constituent and the university. But when we talk about the university, we're talking about professional staff. I've got two really smart interns that are both undergrads uh, in my office. And I realized, you know, you two know a lot more about what students are thinking on a day to day basis than I am. So they're Cadence users um, within our admissions office, and we found a constituency of students that we really felt, felt needed an additional touch point. But in talking to my interns, I said, you know, would it make a difference for them to hear from a current student instead of from this really old admissions director, right? That maybe they look at me skeptically and say, you know, he just wants to convince me to come to, you know, his school. And they worked through Cadence, you know, as 20 somethings and said, hey, I'm a current student at the school. You can ask me anything, good, bad, or ugly. And I just want to keep it real with you. And the way that students just presented themselves and say, wow, like I feel seen by like somebody that's doing what I hope to do at some point and that I can ask, you know, what's your experience been like? It's not that I can't share about my institution, but my students can do it in a different way. Right. So that was kind of like this light bulb moment for us within the last couple of weeks around, you know, that is a relationship that they've built not with me, but somebody that is part of my community. They displayed empathy and we're using technology to meet that end at the same time. Very good. Emily, when I hear things like stories and names, I imagine you have stories and names. So uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I um, so much like Tony, we actually have students that run our Cadence um, platform um, in conjunction with the professional staff. And we have actually found, um, and I'm not sure if this is true at other large research institutions, um, but but there isn't a, you know, the same sort of feeling as there would be at like a St. Mary's institution, St. Mary's University, where it's a small liberal arts school, right? It's a very small community. Um, faculty are there to teach here. Faculty and staff are being pulled in a lot of different directions with research and, you know, large national projects, et cetera. And so Cadence has actually given us an ability to be more personalized, or I would even say personalized at all and empathetic at all to our, our students. Um, and that really has actually made a huge difference for us um, in terms of the students feeling like Hopkins is less about being an institution and more about being a student focused community, which is what we're trying to move towards. Um, and so that really for us has made a big deal um, in terms of our students feeling like we know them. Um, the student that we had running it this past summer prior to orientation, his name is Amir. Um, he's fantastic. Again, much like Tony's students, he can give practical real time advice to the students asking about what classes to register for, how do I pick my roommate, things like that. Things that, you know, 20 years removed, I don't have the ability to, to give that, nor do I really think I should give that advice to students. Um, and, you know, we had Amir speak at convocation for all first year students, and he got a standing ovation because every single student had heard of him, had interacted with him. I mean, he was sort of a, you know, his, their superstar, their Drake, um, for lack of a better word. Um, and that really matters to students um, to see the person behind the texting um, and to know that they're a real student um, going through the same things that they are. Very good. Eric, what do you think about with alumni? Yeah, so, um, you know, what's interesting in, in terms of 
of um, reaching out to alumni via text is I, I think it's a disarming uh, platform in, in many ways because um, I'm, I'm assuming they know that, you know, we're texting more than just one person, but when they ask questions and they receive authentic responses, I think that's a pleasant surprise for them. And, and, and I might add, we always try to add a little bit of whimsy when appropriate. And uh, people enjoy that because not everyone is super serious, you know, 24 hours a day. And, you know, life is tough. I mean, we need to have a little bit of fun. So we'll throw a go big orange in there. Um, we'll, we'll use some emojis here and there. And when, when, when we've done that, um, it really opens the door to, you know, just some enthusiasm and, and some understanding that, hey, you know, this is, this is just like a regular conversation that I may have with a friend. So it, it, it's very disarming in that way. Now, we've had some people who feel very free to express their opinion. And uh, here again, we have to be empathetic to that. And we have shared those opinions with, with folks who need to hear them, but we don't dare uh, take any sides on those opinions. But it's it's been very good to, to hear from a broader audience what they're thinking about. Very good. So Eric, you used a, a magic word here, uh, emojis. I know from working with a number of institutions, some institutions embrace them. Some institutions are very scared of the implications of various emojis. Amy is our technologist here. Uh, what do you think? How should we use techno or how should we use emojis effectively? Well, uh, I don't think that we can deny that emojis are, are part of the vernacular now, um, especially for um, younger and younger generations. So yeah, we got to embrace it. Um, you know, you can do your research, uh, make sure that you're saying what you want to say <laughs> when you use them. But but I, I love that, Eric. And I, I think that that is one of the biggest opportunities is surprise and delight. Um, uh, you know, how can we surprise and delight these people that we're communicating with, um, whether that's by, oh, I'm, I'm talking to an actual person. Wow, I, I wasn't expecting that. Or, oh, look, uh, you know, they've, they've inserted a little bit of humor into my day. Um, so, you know, when, when they have a moment like that with you, um, you know, they, they get a little giddy. Um, that's, that's relationship building. That's the human element at the right moment. Um, and at the end of the day, people remember how we make them feel, right? Absolutely. And if I may plug a resource, Emojipedia will give you all the interpretations of emojis. So if you're ever nervous about uh, using a particular emojis, uh, Emojipedia is fantastic. Um, we are in an industry that really cares about data, whether it be quantitative or qualitative. So starting with Tony, since utilizing technology to help with your communications, what results have you seen? I'm going to add one really quick thing to the emojis. Whenever we write, whenever we write templates in Cadence, um, we don't approve a template unless at least three of our work study students have seen it. Um, Cause I want, I want their response to whether or not something is cringy, effective. Sometimes they're like add an emoji. They'll say, take it away. I trust them to be 18 and 19, not me. Um, but to answer, to answer your question, I really wanted to highlight something regarding the technology use from the staff perspective. Um, I see a lot of my staff really invested in text messaging and without generalizing generations, particularly my millennial and Gen Z staff, I see them really invested in it because they grew up with it, right? Like they're familiar with it. They're comfortable with it. They don't struggle to understand, you know, when text messaging is appropriate, why it's different than email, why it's different, why it's different than other communications, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or it's at scale. Um, they also understand the necessity to be attentive and responsive, right? Because you also don't want to send out text message and text messages and say, hey, I'm, I'll check this tomorrow or the next day. I think there's an immediacy of response that just comes with getting a text and understanding, you know, why we're sending something to somebody. Um, you know, I come back to the transactional piece of enrollment management. There's there's something about being, about being able to do something at scale sometimes that is appropriate. You know, um, Eric talked about event reminders. I think some of those things really are appropriate. But understanding the one-on-one -on -one part and you know i remember when i became director of admissions at saint mary's and asking a lot of people in like their one-on-one -on -one getting to know you meetings like what do you like what do you not like everybody said we hate phone calls right they don't they don't work um and i think there is a place for phone calls um in the work that we do 
but we have to be thoughtful about where we use them, right? And I think text messages or you know other types of technology, it's the same way. We have to be mindful of multimodal communication. There's no way around it. Um, and if we're not doing that, we're wasting our time. But I think really getting your feedback from your staff around what's working and what's not is pretty critical. Very good. So sticking with what's working and what's not. Um, any results you can share with us about what has worked and what's not worked for St. Mary's? Yeah, so I actually put my staff through like this really sadistic exercise when I became director of admissions saying like, you've had a text messaging platform in the past and you haven't used it. So I'm going to show you how grueling calls can be. And I put them through a cold calling exercise and they said, please never again. <laughs> um, and that's when we actually were working with becoming um, Mongoose clients. I was a Mongoose client in my previous institution. And once I showed them the value of how they could use text messaging at scale at an individual level, and again, we've come back to this you know, concept of time, how they could use their time and find efficiencies in time better. We do see better responsiveness from students when we're thoughtful about how we're using it. But I'm getting a lot of time back to my staff too when I'm thinking about showing them how to be efficient with their time and their communication strategies. Yeah. Emily, what results have you seen at Johns Hopkins? Yeah, we've seen quite a few. Um, you know, not that this is the only reason, um, but certainly the improvement in our rankings has gone a long way um, in uh, reinforcing that the ability to um, individually know students by name and story means that they're going to be better retained and graduated by the institution. Um, and so being part of a multi-pronged approach. Um, certainly our text messaging platform has been incredibly important to that. Um, we started to use it in 2020, in the fall of 2020, and um, that was the first, they're now juniors, that was the first group of first and second year students that we saw had a pretty significant dip in transfer, um, transferring out of the institution. Um, so we were really pleased with the um, results of that. The other piece, um, I think much like Tony's um, phone calling exercise, which sounds amazingly awful, um, is that we have used the knowing students by name and story and, and showing that effective effectiveness, excuse me, to actually um, ask for increased resources to decrease our advisor to student ratio um, by showing that if you know students, if they have someone that they can turn to to ask questions of um, that knows them more than just on a transactional rubber stamping your class registration form, that's really going to matter in terms of the student's um, persistence at the institution, as well as their satisfaction with their experience at Hopkins. So um, we certainly have seen a lot of great results directly in our um, student attrition, um, as well as our student satisfaction rates. Very good. Eric, what's the impact been for alumni engagement and annual giving? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. So, um, you know, Bob Dylan always said, you know, when I paint my masterpiece, right? Well, I, I'm not painting a masterpiece, but I'm putting a, an annual giving calendar together. And what's interesting is I, I put a lot of thought into timing. Timing is everything. And um, when it comes to email, and, and I'm not bashing email, the email is, is a tool and, and we're integrating everything. So, so it's still important. But you know what I've seen is that when I send emails, I know when we're sending it, but I don't know when people are receiving it. And, and here again, timing is everything. When I send a text, I know when people are receiving it because it's right there front and center on their phone. So a couple of examples. Um, you know, our, our senior giving program has been incredibly successful, and, and I take my hat off to my colleagues um, who run that program. And in the past year, we had about a third of our graduating seniors make a gift back to the university. And, and when we do so, we want to steward those gifts. And, and with students, we want to have a little bit of fun in doing that. And so we did an experiment. We just said, hey, you know, let's let's send a text reminder um, for for the stewardship event. And we've had decent um, attendance in the past at these kind of events. But the first time we sent a text, um, we were overwhelmed by the number of students who actually attended the event. You know how we always play the game of, hey, if there's 500 people that we send an email to, maybe we'll get 100 that'll register and maybe 75 will show up. Well, um, we, we had um, over 500 students show up and we were expecting about 350 as I understand it. 
So um, it's incredibly effective in a timely manner. So that text going out a couple of days before the event seemed to be more effective than the email that went out two weeks before and one week before and so on and so forth. Um, the other arena in terms of alumni giving, um, in, in August, we celebrate uh, Black Philanthropy Month. And our Black Alumni Council uh, about three years ago came to us and said, hey, we, we needed to rally around this month and we need to provide people uh, with opportunities to give that are meaningful to them. And um, each year we become a little bit more sophisticated in how we put this program together. But um, this year, and I was just talking with a colleague about this earlier today, our texting uh, campaigns actually outperformed our, um, our email campaigns, and those had actually done very well in the past. And it also drove more people to our crowdfunding site um, to, to support the Black Alumni Scholarship. So, um, you know, we had an initial goal of raising uh, $10,000. We raised $30,000. And um, you know we're on this journey to to get to a million dollars, and we're sitting at around two hundred and seventy thousand. So um, in in both student engagement and alumni giving, it's worked very well for us. Very good. So um, sometimes things don't always work as planned. Uh, what lessons would you have uh, when texting, using chat? Um, for institutions, uh, maybe learning from something that didn't resonate the way you intended. Uh, what holes did you find in the process with the technology? And if we could start with Tony. Yeah, you got to be real humble to understand that you can't control everything, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're in shared spaces. Um, so stepping away from text messaging, you know, we try to engage our students through social avenues where we're working in groups. And it's it's powerful, right, to not just be like the only person in the room talking to the students. Sometimes you're having other university constituents um, talk on the institution's behalf or you're having students talk to each other. You know, I can control what I say for better or worse, and sometimes I'm going to flub it too. Um, but you cannot control what every single person at your university is going to say, how it's going to land, and you never know what somebody's going to say in a shared space from the constituent group that you're talking to. So you have to be prepared for what happens sometimes when conversations go sideways. Um, when somebody has a critique, you know, as Eric mentioned, you know, if somebody has something that they really want to say, um, they're going to say it. But I think the best thing that you can do is understand that these are also avenues that provide, you know, a space for vulnerability for people to really share what they think. Sometimes it's not exactly what you want to hear, but at least it's providing some context for honest conversations. Very good. Emily, what do you think with current students? Yeah, we, um, so we have done the emoji, like, you know, respond with your favorite emoji about how you're doing and um, seemed pretty innocuous to me, but you have to also be prepared to get students in a variety of moods and emotions and, mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe naively or foolishly, maybe both, we were not. And so how do you deal with someone who texts back the crying emoji? You know, what is the response to that? Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of that planned out in advance, um, unfortunately, and resulted in us scrambling to figure out what the right response is. Um, do we need to call in, you know, mental health experts? You know, there, there's too much um, ambiguity sometimes with an emoji um, to know exactly what the person means behind it. Um, so that was definitely a fail on our part. Um, and we've since learned we, we um, scarcely use the emoji responses now. Um, I will also say that one of the challenges, I'm not sure if Tony agrees with this or, or not, but um, in using students to answer questions um, for us at Hopkins, where there are two distinct schools, if you're using a student who's in the engineering school, they may not be able to answer specific questions around the arts and sciences majors. Um, and so that can cause some confusion and some challenges if they, you know, pop in a response that actually isn't true or is no longer true for that particular group of students or student. Um, so really making sure that you have some quality control on the answers somehow um, and balancing that authenticity with direct knowledge is really important. And we learned that the hard way. Mm. Very good. Eric, what have you learned? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, number one, um, segmentation and, and making sure that the message really fits the audience is even more important in the texting world. Um, if you are off in any way, shape or form, you're going to hear about it. 
And uh, you you can't because you are in such an interactive environment. You can't just say, "Oh well, that, you know, I don't need to respond to that." No, you need to respond to everyone. So you need to be very careful in terms of segmentation. In my experience, this is not a mass kind of tool to send, you know, to a, a incredibly large group of people. What does uh, that mean to you? What's an incredibly large group in your mind? Um, so. So my colleagues have reacted to texting in a variety of different ways, but some have thought, you know what, this is going to be a great way we can reach a large group of people, for an example, at the end of the calendar year to, to ensure that they're making a gift. Well, if somebody's never given before, do you think they're even thinking about, oh, it's the end of the calendar year and I really need to make my gift? No, they're probably not. And so they're going to let you know that that's the case. So the rule of thumb that we have is what is the what event took place to make this text happen? Mm -hmm. If there is no event that took place, there's not really a reason to send that text. But I'll share one other example with you. One of our um, more famous alumni, Josh Dobbs, um, who's an incredible quarterback, and by the way, an aerospace engineer, uh, perhaps that's how he throws the football so well. Um, but uh, Josh is on our alumni board of directors, and um, he is one of the most enthusiastic supporters that we have. And he gets involved in our giving day every year, and he offers his own match, and it's our social media match. And uh, this past year, he offered to be the sender of one of our text messages to a select group of people who we thought really kind of fit that social media crowd because they had given um, through similar avenues before. The problem is nobody believed it was actually Josh Dobbs texting them. And it wasn't actually Josh Dobbs. Josh approved the message. Uh, but, you know, we were sitting there. And so when people ask, hey, Josh, is this really you? Uh, you can't lie and you have to be truthful with them. So we learned a lesson there. Very good. So starting with Tony, when did you realize you needed to streamline your communications to create these genuine relationships and uh, what opportunities uh, rose since implementing a tool? Yeah, so I became director of admission at St. Mary's in August of 2020, which if everyone recalls was a really tough time, um, really tough time to move institutions, move to a new city, find a new place to live, find a new place for your kid to go to school. Um, and I came to a staff that was rarely physically present in the office. Um, you know, travel was suspended. Um, you know, there, there were times where we went months without people being even in the same outdoor space at the same time. And we were just kind of examining where we were in our own interpersonal relationships as colleagues, coworkers, you know, people that we had missed occasions for, family. And we kind of used that to really start to talk about the necessity for authenticity and relationship building, right? Like, again, this is a process, but everybody was struggling with, you know, what it was like to be a high school student, people that were missing prom and graduation, people that had suffered, you know, some type of loss, including the most extreme type of life loss from people that they really cared about. Um, and this, and the necessity to humanize the process, you know, in a lot of ways. And sometimes we tried to do that as best as we could with technology. Um, we're a Zimi partner. I, I keep coming back to like the way that we were having students build relationship with each other when they weren't able to build relationship with the kids at their own schools, you know, and, you know, 10 years ago, I never would have imagined trying to have social platforms for people to create community. And I'm an observer in the platform. Like I rarely try to get engaged because I don't want to like sully the space for students. Um, but it's great to see just the transparency and vulnerability that our staff shares with students, that students share with each other, the way that they celebrate each other, you know, the way that they share their concerns, their aspirations, but, you know, kind of really using the last two and a half years to say, you know, life has really been tough for a lot of people, um, our staff, our faculty, our current students, our prospective students, and and really acknowledging and affirming students. Yeah, there's not a single event that we host on campus that I speak to students that I don't stop and tell them, I may not know your individual story, but you do know what I know. You're here and I'm proud of you for that. Like you made that decision to show up today. You know, a student submitting an, an inquiry form or the RFI or submitting an application, that's them showing up for the next step and they might be terrified. Um, so just kind of affirming them and just kind of saying like, you know, we, we're not all in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. 
and have been for the last two plus years and just kind of acknowledging the humanity and using the technology to be a medium for how we build the relationship and, and acknowledging them was a real bright spot for us in the last few years. Very good. Emily, what was the uh, impetus for you? Yeah, so much like Tony, um, we started using uh, the texting platform in um, June 2020. Um, and that was because um, we had some early indicators that we probably were not bringing students back to campus in the fall. And really our um, community building was focused in the residence halls. And um, we have a very high um, RA to student ratio. It's about one to 65. And so we knew that there was gonna be essentially almost no safety net for all of our students across you know, wherever they were living during the fall. Um, and we realized that to get to know students by name and story, we had to completely rethink the way that we were engaging with them. Um, and so this, this proved to be one way that we actually could completely overhaul um, our onboarding model for new students and also their families, um, really, and it's met with a lot of success. We've managed to keep the changes we've implemented um, for COVID because we know that students feel um, like they're being seen by the institution as a result. Very good. Eric, what do you think? Uh, there's a theme here. Um, certainly, um, the the pandemic was uh, the impetus for us to kind of um, accelerate our plans to adopt new technologies um, and realize that we needed to adapt to this new environment. And so when we launched our engagement center, part of that launch was was adding texting. And um, uh, so, so there are sort of the normal kind of business transactions that are taking place that involve text messages, and that's been very successful because we ask people, uh, hey, you know, do you want me to send you a follow-up email, a follow-up text, both, you know, what, do you, what would you like? And it's, it's kind of split, but there are a lot of people who want both. But what I have seen is that the text messages tend to be more actionable in terms of follow up on those business processes. So um, that that has been a very um, good thing for us. Um, but it's also been an opportunity to experiment a little bit. And um, you know, there when you think about it, the average alumnus or alumna um, doesn't have a lot of real personalized interactions. Um, on a regular basis with their alma mater. And uh, this was a way where we could really kind of expand that because it is personal and it is an opportunity to engage in a dialogue. Very good. We have many questions in the Q&A. Uh, please remember to upvote those. Uh, I see a number of them that I love um, already. We wanna make sure we leave plenty of time for them. So in rapid fire format, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds or less, I guess. Uh, starting with Tony, um, if folks were logging off right now, what is the one takeaway you would want uh, people to uh, get? Even though they should stay for Q&A because it's- They should stay for Q&A, but I would say really quickly, tech is a tool um, and it's a really valuable tool, but it's not the how of your building relationships. Um, I work with prospective students. So for those of you that are in seats similar to mine, talk to your current students about their recent experiences, ask them how they felt, why they chose your institution, why they didn't choose another institution, ask them what keeps them here. Um, it's not enough to, for them to walk through the doors. You want them to graduate You know, at the end of the day. Um, ask them why their experience was special. The stories are really powerful. Um, and even when it's messy, the relationship to drive, should drive everything you do, including how you use your tech. Very good. Emily, what do you think? I think um, if you're going to use an interactive tech tool, you need an authentic student voice behind it um, in order to really connect with your students um, and that that authentic student voice um, really needs to come from a student that you trust um, to deliver the messages that you want for students. Very good. Eric, rapid fire, what do we think? Um, technology is not a panacea, but it has its niches. And, and when you find um, synergy, that's when you realize you're onto something. And, um, you know, we have found that synergy in deploying some of these things. And they've, you know, they have saved us some time. They have produced greater results. But, you know, it's, it's something that you got to experiment with. You got to um, engage other people, understand how they're using these kind of things. And, um, you know, put a lot of thought into it. And in the end, um, you're going to see good results. Very good. Amy, what takeaways would you have? 
Well, I get the benefit of going last so I can say, yes, I agree with all these wonderful folks here. And yeah, I, I think for me, you know, technology just gives you more ways to care and connect and listen. <laughs> That's so important and learn. Um, and it's, it's that connection and that learning that are going to allow you to continue to improve and see success. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, Dave, we could bring you back on. We have some amazing questions here in the questions and answers. I already see one that you're ex super excited um, to answer. Maybe we can go to that one first since you had uh, marked it as yours. But uh, thank you everyone for participating and can't wait to talk about these questions. Yeah, Mike, <clears throat> the one that I marked, I meant to mark, I was going to type it back. Uh, do we oh. integrate with Salesforce? I was just going to type yes. So but it wouldn't let me undo the live. Um, so um, one, one of them that, that I thought was really interesting is, have you employed students who've also been on the receiving ends of these campaigns? And what are their thoughts when considering both sides? So for those of you, of, uh, of you that have been, have been doing this for more than one cycle, have you had that opportunity? Any of you? Yeah, I'll jump in really quick, Dave. Um, one of the two interns that I had mentioned who's actively reaching out to some of our prospective student segments, um, she's finishing her, sorry, she just started her second year at St. Mary's. Um, she was a senior in high school when we implemented Cadence. So she was on the receiving end from me as the director of admission and from one of our admission counseling staff. And that's how you know a lot of the manifestation of the relationship with the admissions office started for her. So she feels really invested, especially at this time of the year when students are still doing a lot of exploration and are sifting through their options, wanting to be that for students because she can communicate what her experience was like, not just as a senior within the last couple of years, but also with her work in the admission through the admissions office when she was a high school senior, including through texting. Valuable to have her for for sure. I'm trying to not let her go. She's got a couple more years before she graduates. So. <laughs> Emily, have you had that experience at Johns Hopkins? Yes, we have. So the student um, who we used this past summer had a more, you know, normal quote unquote experience um, since we didn't bring students back in the fall of 2021. And what was great about that is he was able to help us understand a little bit more about how we should nuance the messages to really hit home to his class, because um, it is true that every class is different. And so understanding, you know, the subtle variations that we need in between the class of, you know, 2026 versus 2025 has been incredibly helpful, including knowing like what landed well and what didn't land well, and how can we, um, you know, better pivot our messages to the students that are coming in. Very good. All right, Dave, I think we can probably do some more questions. So there was one directly for Eric. Uh, Eric, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you analyze engagement? Um, is, is it just responses or is there anything that's more in depth than that? Um, so so within the, the texting platform, it is, it is responses, um, but it's also um, outcomes. So, so attendance, giving, um, and and I shared this the other day um, when when we were in the midst of uh, Black Philanthropy Month and in our texting campaign on behalf of the Black, Black Alumni Scholarship. There were a lot of people um, that that we included um, that, based upon our scoring, we thought they would be good prospects but they'd never given before. And a fair amount of them had some very good questions. And, and to kind of follow up on the last question, you know, we have interns um, that work with us who are students and, and they're involved in, in Cadence. We also have some young alumni on our staff and then old folks like me. So we kind of represent all the generations. And um, what I found to be interesting is that um, a lot of the uh, people who'd never given before that ask questions, uh, authentic questions about, hey, tell me more about this, or I don't understand how this works. Who, who is this supporting? Tell me a little bit more. Um, they ended up making a gift. Um, and you know, do I think they would have given otherwise? I don't know. But what I do know is having that interaction, having an opportunity to address their questions and, and let them know exactly, hey, this is exactly how it functions. And by the way, this is one of our most unique scholarships because it's a four-year scholarship. 
Hmm. So, you know, this is a scholarship for students throughout their entire career, career while they're on campus. So um, it was a great way to, to see that um, there were fruits from our labor. Very good. Thank you, Eric. Dave, what do we got next? Um, let's talk about scaling. So um, volume it can be intimidating, right? If, if there's a whole bunch of applications or a whole bunch of students, we, we don't want to create the expectation of having a conversation if we're not able to. So the question is, how can institutions maintain personal touch as enrollment scales? Uh, this particular person has more than 10,000 applications last fall. And be, being able to know each, each student is just not feasible. Is there a way to identify students who could benefit from this most? Um, Tony, I'm, 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 I'm curious to hear your yeah. thoughts on that. And I would also say that the um, rate at which you can manage or send text and manage responses and conversations is much more efficient than people think. So, but 10,000 at one minute sounds like it's, it's not a good plan. No, I, I would totally agree, Dave, on everything you said. And I, you know, we're a small liberal arts college. There's never a time that we're sending out 10,000 messages at once. I would go and ask, you know, are there things that happen cyclically um, or that can be trigger events for your students that you can say, hey, I'm going to use this event to reach out to a group of students at scale, but not necessarily your entire constituency. And I'll tell you like one example of how we do that. Um, it's really tough to say, I'm going to message 10,000 students that applied for admission to say, congratulations on, on submitting your app, but power users, right, or administrators in Cadence have the ability to send a message on behalf of other users in the system. So we can have one person in the office that can talk to all of our team and say, hey, everybody that applied for admission last week will get a message from you, their admission counselor, on this day at this time, block out your calendar for like an hour or two after to just manage the responses, right? So we can create continuity and make sure that students have very similar experiences as they move through the admissions and enrollment process while kind of centralizing how we do it, where the messages are still personalized, right? It still has their name. We can insert their major. We can insert you know, where they go to school. We can insert the name of their admission counselor. And it becomes easier for us to kind of manage that at scale, but let admissions officers manage the responses so we can kind of create that continuity and people know what to expect right from the staff side um i'll also add really quickly it's related to another question about best practices don't send out messages if there's not somebody to respond mm -hmm. right like not a best practice sending out a text message at 4 55 if your office closes at five and nobody's going to manage that after five um we have seen after two years of working with mongoose as a as a cadence partner 80 percent of our responses come in the first two hours I don't know if that's everybody's kind of, you know, experience with the platform or with text messaging, but we use that now as there's proof in the pudding. I may not be able to get to everybody, but if I know I'm doing stuff at big scale, right, where I'm reaching 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 students because there's event reminders, there's a critical deadline for depositing for financial aid. If we know we've got a lot of messages coming out, I have to have staff to manage it for at least 120 minutes after, because what I don't want is to create urgency in the mind of my constituent and then have them staring into the void at the end of the day. Right. Very good point. Sounds like that wouldn't be a good way to build a good relationship. <laughs> um, we no. really care. Talk to you tomorrow. Um, we can probably fit in uh, what one tip or best practice would you recommend for other in institutions who are just starting to use tech uh, to connect with students? I, I think Amy, uh, if you could answer that as our product manager, because you've seen many, many schools use tech, but but if you had to pick one tip, what would that be? You know, I think the very first tip that I would share is whatever you think your audiences want <laughs> in terms of where um, you meet them and what content you think you should give them, just let that go and instead ask them. Um, talk to them, uh, where where do they want you to be? How quickly do they want you to respond? What do they want to know? Um, what kind of relationship do they wanna have with you? Um, you know, Tony mentioned humility. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, we're, we're people helping people. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't help anyone if, if we are toiling at the wrong thing. So um, listen, that's my first tip. Very good. Nice. 
Um, I think we can you do one more question. Um, can you give examples of some messaging that was successful in getting students to register for next term or meeting with their advisor? Has that been successful for any of you panelists? Uh, so I'm happy to answer this. Um, and I, you know, you can outreach to me directly um, for the actual language that we used. Um, but we, um, much like um, Tony was saying, your ability to customize that message per population, um, depending on what you're looking for, actually is, is the best tip I think um, that I could give you. So, you know, making sure your public health students get a different message about what the registration requirements are versus your mechanical engineers actually really matters. Um, and again, coming back to that authenticity and knowing students by name and story, your ability to dissect out um, that kind of information, I think, is your most effective strategy um, in terms of getting students to respond to your message about course registration or advisor meetings. Thank you very much, Emily, for trying to squeeze that in right, right under the gun here. Um, thank you all that joined us today. Uh, everyone will receive a recording of this pre this presentation. Thank you to our panelists, uh, Tony, Emily, Eric, and, and Amy, and for Mike for moderating our discussion. Thank you to Inside Higher Ed for partnering with us to discuss this important topic. At Mongoose, we're always sharing industry best practices and, and insights, so follow us on social media channels to stay in touch. Um, if anyone had questions that they did not get answered and you'd like to email me, I'd be happy to quarterback that to get you the, res the responses that you want. My email is dave, D-A-V-E, at mongooseresearch.com. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>